healthcare is actually wherever the patient is and most of the patient live outside the hospital so it's a mindset change also for the hospitals which has started now through telemedicine they can cater to a larger mass than only the beds what they cater to welcome to the blue circle and thank you very much for joining it's such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone our distinguished panelists who are hand picked because of the think input and the rich experience they bring in and thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us we've received over 150 registrations and 90% of whom are cos and cxos uh, many of them are repeat visitors to our webinars so which is very encouraging and motivates us to even provide higher levels of dialogues through the online channels as well for those of you who are new with us today the blue circle is an ecosystem to help leaders manage disruptive times and become future ready we focus on the four fundamental sectors which are healthcare energy e mobility real estate and infra we also present socio economic insights which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market in response to the covid challenge the blue circle also has accentuated its digital presence one of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series our active digital uh, publication we're also building a hand picked domain focused expert pool drawn from within our community from our member base and its associates that will guide businesses during and post covid in these four sectors in addition to this and you would be happy to know uh, and, and well many of our members are already aware of this we are soon launching a digital platform for leaders the linkedin for leaders wherein we will present to them the opportunity of connecting with people just like them also house highly curated quality content and meaningful conversations on the platform so those leaders among you who are interested to write to uh, uh, to join in please do write to us uh, and the topic for today's session is rise in telehealth the discussion will revolve around the headwinds and tailwinds which telehealth faced pre covid the triggers which have sparked its phenomenal growth post covid and the shape of things to come in the future we've invited prominent practitioners and thought leaders from the sector and now in the best interest of time i will just quickly mention their respective names and designations we have with us mr amit munjal founder and ceo dr insta ms geeta manjunath phd founder and ceo niramai dr satish prasad rat chief innovation and research officer astra dm healthcare at the moderator for the session is mr pavan choudhury best selling author ceo of french multinational vigon india chairman medical technology association of india and sits on several boards across the country welcome sirs and ma'am to the discussion today and thank you for joining us uh, also kindly note that we will have q and a towards the end of the session and while some of you have shared excellent questions they are now with the moderator and now i request mr choudhury to please begin the session sir thank you very much siddharth and it's a big pleasure to be with you all with this uh, enlightened panel as well as distinguished audience like always and so great big pleasure um i have received some very good questions from uh, distinguished uh, uh, audience and i will try to weave them in our talk track and if there is uh, anything left then i would also try to include it towards the end of the session so uh coming to the topic the rise of telehealth so first of all let us uh break this word telehealth down because telehealth means not only distance healthcare in the clinical space but also non clinical uh interventions so let us stick to you know, for reasons of uh, manageability uh, telemedicine which is the diagnosis treatment and prevention of diseases or injuries uh and education and research provided at a distance so it is the natural evolution of healthcare in the digital world however why did it not evolve so fast yet till covid came this is the first issue which li we'd like to discuss and i will invite uh, uh, dr geeta manju manjunath uh, geeta why do you what what was 
keeping telehealth, what was restraining it? Yeah, thanks, uh, Paman, and uh, great to be part of this uh, session. And uh, you know, thanks for including me in the panel. Uh, yeah, so basically, I feel there are three main reasons uh, uh, and and challenges that was uh, you know um, obstructing, if I can use the word, uh, to make telehealth uh, as big as it's probably going to be in future. Uh, the first and foremost on the patient side, uh, you know. Uh, there's a lot of hesitation for the patient uh, to take advice from the doctor over phone or video or something as opposed to a face-to-face -face interaction. We always talk about what that humane interaction, the trust that's needed uh, in, in adhering to the address, adhering to the prescriptions uh, and messaging that the doctor gives, uh, you know, that, that trust element between the patient and the doctor. Uh, and because of that, you know, the patients have to sort of start using it and so on. So there was some, um, you know, reservations there and people were more comfortable going in and meeting face to face. And I think that has changed now. Uh, COVID has made it more uh, inevitable that, you know, they try to do as much as possible from home, including their especially non-COVID care happening uh, right out of their home. And the telehealth is a beautiful, uh, you know, platform or a mechanism to actually get that done. The second big thing is as a technologist, right, I, I would like to sort of look at what are the things that were uh, lacking in the technology framework. So one of the sensor end, like, you know, are we able to understand, are, are the doctors able to understand the uh, patient, uh, let's say, vital signs or any other type of, uh, you know, quantitative information that they wanted to know so that the uh, prescription or the diagnosis is more accurate. So the point of care devices uh, being used by the uh, end users and availability of these devices to be on medical grade, if you can say that, uh, was, was one thing. Then the transmission itself being more private and making sure that the security, data security layer is there, there is enough bandwidth to make the video conference look like what we are doing right now, rather than, uh, you know, something that's a lot of shaky uh, gaps and so on. So suddenly you start feeling the personalized nature of it. Uh, go, goes for a toss and then finally on uh, the cloud side right so uh, how do we have a secure way of uh, saving the information if somebody wants to if the doctor wants to relook at the uh, session the previous session they have the same patient how do we do this how does the doctor himself or herself access the infrastructure uh, and same at the patient end. So all of these sort of the technological piece, uh, you know, is also gotten accelerated while it has developed over years, uh, you know, now um, being put into use, uh, you know, there is more, um, uh, you know, uh, less hurdles, I would say, more adoption possible. And finally, at the, uh, the doctor's end, right, uh, the process aspect of it, how does uh, a telehealth patient uh, picture in the list of huge line of uh, OPD patients that they were uh, addressing before. So, so that also, uh, thankfully, I guess, uh, or not uh, due to COVID, there is a reduction in the OPD. And so there is uh, hopefully more time for the doctor to uh, weave in these telehealth patients as well uh, and fit into their schedule. And of course, there are a few of the technological trust elements, even at the doctor and is the doctor really speaking or is somebody else talking instead of them. So there are some of those challenges yet to be addressed. But I think uh, yeah. infrastructure wise and the, especially the trust wise and um, you yeah. know, not, uh, adoption wise, I think we really see a difference in adoption, a huge uh, level of increase in adoption, um, you know, the trigger being yeah. COVID. Yeah. So you, you feel that the obstacles were trust and acceptance by the patient as well as by the doctor, the technology and infrastructure which was lacking and privacy and some process issues. Great points. So coming to the fact that COVID has unleashed uh, telemedicine, what do you think are the reasons, uh, Dr. Satish, why telemedicine has got such a big impetus through COVID, how is it helping the patient and the doctor? So, uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Blue Circle and especially Mr. Pawan for having me in the panel. Uh, that's a great question. So, uh, I think uh, what COVID did with, uh, you know, 20 years of persuasion from both technology and telemedicine, let's say practitioners could not do uh, because it would made telemedicine as the only way to experience health or let's say healthcare from a distance or healthcare from a non-urgent care settings and healthcare from the aftercare setting. 
why telehealth took so long to get adopted maybe you know i can say that you know it used to be a tech push so it was the technology which was available for video conferencing and consulting over a distance and few sensors were also there so that you know we can have the history can have the diagnosis uh, for non urgent cases or non acute cases but somewhere that comfort or that you can say that inertia was always there in the healthcare system as well as the regulators that uh, we are already busy with what we are doing and this is not something which is so important for us to you know get into due to covid what happened is there was a double whammy or there was a double edged sword how covid attacked the healthcare system for covid uh, people who were infected uh, were to be quarantined so they cannot go to a crowded setting or a physical consultation where the doctor or the healthcare worker were also susceptible for the treatment so i think you know consultation which is non contact was very very important so that was a very important or essential thing to have covid consultation and because covid the usual hospitals became the centers of covid care so normal patients who were non acute you know stopped going to the hospitals in fear of getting covid or getting contacted by covid so all of a sudden chronic managements second opinions you know taking normal consultation like vaccinations let's say taking consultation like will be are doing the refill of the medicines or i'll be doing few consultations like where privacy was very important like mental health or sexual health which uh, you know uh, doctor insta is also working on so these things came to the forefront which were always there as a essentiality but now they have become more of a necessity so the healthcare systems to survive now you know which are going through a lot of problems because you know opd footfalls have come down elective surgeries have come down so they are now looking this as a survival modality to you know survive in the system so yeah. if they adopt telehealth they can uh, cater to the covid quarantine patients without exposing the healthcare workers but most important they can only take care of the chronic care patients which are 80% of our cases if they can manage it through telehealth so in some way i think you know covid has made the world upside down but in some way it has done also good by exposing the gaps in the healthcare system where healthcare system which was tertiary care or sick care was considered as the only way healthcare was done preventive care and after care was somewhere you know obliterated from the normal healthcare now this has made telehealth as a possibility that's where we are seeing most of the digital health companies making very good growth yeah so i think you have uh, highlighted a very interesting point you have spoke you have alluded to the conservatism in the profession that and that is also reflected through the slow or glacial place of pace of uh, healthcare reform where healthcare reform is spoken of as a renovator's delight you cannot change much you have to just add small pieces and shifts uh, in mental models do not happen so fast and uh, covid has uh, uh, perhaps been that trigger which has brought in the fear of the infection as the guiding force to bring in telehealth of course the other advantages which will come through that telehealth adoption or telemedicine adoption are reduced travel expenses it will save time it will save maybe medical cost less disruption of the work schedule of the patient and uh, uh, greenhouse emissions they are saying it will save and another important point is doctor behavior so many a time uh we are finding that uh, i mean research finds that uh, there are there are cohorts there are people um, millions of people now who only like to interact with technology they don't want to interact through with people because interaction with people is stressful and sometimes interaction with doctors or medical facilities can also be stressful so that also is another advantage plus the stigmatized indications like sexologies Uh, or psychiatric consultations or alcoholism etc also can be uh, easily dealt with through telemedicine without exposing yourself or your car etc to people who are uh, who can know that you are taking consultations for such things also uh, accuracy they are saying white coat hypertension which happens when you are taking uh, blood pressure of the patient in the white coat with a mask and all that may or that can also be another unintended benefit of telemedicine coming to amit amit what do you think are the 
are the advantages for the doctor from te uh, telemedicine? I think the advantages from the doctor's perspective for telemedicine, uh, let me put it this way. I think keeping everything else constant, going to a doctor's clinic and getting yourself checked has no close substitute. Mm -hmm. What telemedicine makes beneficial for the doctor and the patient is that many a times patients end up kicking the can down the road and saying that, oh, you know, maybe this will go away by itself. Apne aap theek ho jayega. Or many a times because of paucity of time, many patients end up uh, self-medicating. So telemedicine comes handy. Why? Because now patients don't have to worry about wasting three to four hours of time going to a clinic, dealing with the parking ordeals, navigating through bumper to bumper traffic, waiting in the waiting room of the doctor. Doctor can do the consultation then and there. Uh, we are telemedicine and provide a right resolution for the patient. Uh, the other great advantage for a doctor is that a typical catchment area for, uh, for these doctors who are primarily physicians or general medical practitioners or dermatologists or pediatricians, uh, which means that they are not in invasive procedure categories. They are not surgeons. The typical catchment area for these doctors is what? 10, 15 kilometers? Nobody goes you know, beyond 15, 20 kilometers, let's say, in a worst case to go see a primary care physician. With telemedicine, now the whole country becomes your catchment area. Anyone from you know, Kashmir to Kanyakumari or from Assam to Andhra, uh, Assam to Ahmedabad could now you know, tap at the app and visit the doctor virtually. So those friction points are long gone. Uh, the other advantage uh, is for certain, uh, you know, discrete uh, practice areas that you also alluded to earlier, like psychiatry, psychology, sexology, where the social stigma across the world is high and more high in a country like India, where people don't want to be seen at these clinics and they choose the farthest possible doctor operating out of dark alleys of the city to go get the consultation from. So with telemedicine platforms like Dr. Insta, you don't have to worry about what if my car is seen outside the sexologist's uh, clinic or you know, if I'm consulting a psychiatrist, people would call me crazy. So all those you know, behavioral fears could be put on the back burner and you can do these consults from the you know, privacy of your own home or office and then take it from there. Yeah. Uh, the financially speaking, for the doctors, it's, it's a great time saver. Uh, if you're a hospitalist or running your own clinic, uh, you know, the revenue that you can generate for yourself still comes out to be the same, which means that your rate per hour actually improves. Why? Because in the past, if you're working in a hospital, first of all, you are at the whim and the mercy of the hospital roster as to whether you're given a day shift or a graveyard shift. And now you can manage your own schedule. You can say, okay, I'm going to operate from this time to this time. And you take it from there. So you become the boss of your own calendar and no hospital dictates your schedule. Also, if you are, if you're running your own clinic, there are a lot of fixed costs involved in terms of real estate, uh, other infrastructural costs. Whereas if you are a telemedicine practitioner, you can cut the cord on those costs. So it's all variable now. You can dedicate one small area study or you know private niche in your own home and start doing the consults and make the same amount of revenue that you are making as a hospitalist or as someone who was running his own clinic uh, in any bigger city. Yeah. So these are some of the tangible and intangible advantages of practicing telemedicine. Uh, you clearly save on commute time as a doctor going to a hospital in most <laughs> cities like you know Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, etc. 
you end up wasting two hours of your time. And now you can dedicate those two hours to practicing and seeing your patients. Uh, So these are at a very high level, the advantages of telemedicine that comes to the board for the uh, doctors. Yeah. Also the allied points which uh, emerge from here are the missed appointments. Sometimes patients don't turn up, cancellations, waiting room pressure is a big problem which doctors face where they are waiting and just as doctors can be uh, difficult at times, patients can also be difficult. You know, they can insist that why have I to wait and so on. And the other point which you brought in from the provider perspective can be added to triaging uh, to make sure that you only get those people in your precincts who are really needing critical care and you filter out the rest through through, uh, telemedicine. Any other point you would like to add from a doctor's perspective, Dr. Satish, which uh, goes in favor of uh, telemedicine practice? So uh, definitely, uh, I think, uh, in addition to what all Amit said, uh, is uh, uh, it takes away the wait time. And uh, if telemedicine is used in the proper way, let's say, especially for follow-up or let's say for secondary opinion, uh, a doctor can actually save time. So if I'm a doctor and then, you know, the patient is coming to me for a consultation uh, through telemedicine platform, I can know actually for what complaint this person is coming from, or if I can stitch all the past records, it can also give me some prescriptive analytics that, you know, this person might have come for this kind of a condition. So uh, this improves the accuracy of diagnosis, as well as this improves the time wait, wait period for this, as well as what we call as the cognitive load of a doctor. So unless in a physical consultation before the patient enters to the room, I'm not aware much about, you know, what this patient is about and what he's going to talk and everything. Whereas all these things can be shown to me in my telemedicine platform. This person is a old diabetic, having alcoholism as a problem with a comorbid, you know, uh, hypertension condition with uh, smoking and this and that. So I can be prepared well, save that time for my diagnosis. Second point is uh, telemedicine or let's say, you know, digital medicine, if we can say like that, can also help in a lot of automation and suggesting me what can be the follow-up sequence for this, what can be the possible outcome of this, if we have the existing, let's say, availability of those uh, parameters with me. And third thing is with invention of a lot of new sensors, as the patient is talking with me, I can know the mental condition of the patient. We have also technology where we can, you know, which we worked in Xerox is, uh, we can know about the vital parameters of the patient as the patient is actually presenting to me or what is the you know, other parameters of the person. So it has got a lot of advantages uh, for as a doctor. But you know, alluding to your you know, initial question, why there has been such a late uh, adoption of uh, technology or telehealth for the healthcare practitioners, if I wear the hat as a doctor, I think Telemedicine has been very heavy on the tele side or the technology side, but you know, let's say typical consultation can be broken down into taking history, uh, doing the diagnosis and then doing a prescription. There is very little uh, automation which has happened in these three fields. So still the patient has the responsibility to produce the history. The doctor has still the responsibility of, let's say, writing down a digital prescription, which is very difficult. There are not enough softwares for that, as well as, you know, doing a prescription, which is e-prescription on top of it. So let's say my wife is a doctor, but she struggles to write on a telemedicine application, uh, and which is a challenge and which is a challenge with so many other people. So telemedicine to be sustainable, they have to look for automation into these three fields, uh, which is going to be uh, driving adoption for doctors. So automation in the history taking part, which will make you know patients also feel easier. Automation in the diagnosis part, with the let's say uh, doctors will find it much more easier and swifter to produce a prescription and a digital prescription which can be acted upon. So if these three areas, I think telemedicine applications like uh, Amis firm or other firms are looking at, this will be increasing adoption in a much more larger way. Excellent points. Excellent. You brought in, brought in the cognitive load. You have brought in the archives, easily available and uh, uh, and uh, you know manifestable archives uh, through which you can decide whether the patient uh, is allergic to a particular medicine, what is his background, what is his ethnicity, and so on. Uh, that will improve accuracy and digital prescription. I fully agree. 
the digital prescription uh, system should be standardized by the government uh, that that will empower the patient as well as reduce errors as well as allow monitoring of the uh, uh, of the of the prescriptions so great points coming back to geeta geeta you are an entrepreneur also and uh, a very uh, let me say path breaking one what is it that you'd like to add uh, uh, to what uh, amit then satish have said uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the telemedicine's advantages to patient and doctors and yeah. thereafter i'll come to the payer when i'll go back to dr satish and amit okay thank you uh, pam uh, for allowing me to say because i was very excited to hear uh, satish talk about lot of data looking at history and and uh, you know there is technology support needed for the telemedicine uh, because that is a real plug for ai based solutions for example right so here is where we could in future sort of also be seeing it happening uh, put in artificial intelligence based uh, you know guidance uh, for uh, let's say summarizing the history and predicting uh, you know what uh, likely uh, may be wrong this can also include some of the um, wearable devices that or a point of care devices that the patient would have used right uh, before or through this uh, process of consultation and then uh, also do some kind of a treatment planning or treatment suggestions uh, you know like for example if you suggest this particular medicine then this is the likelihood of uh that being effective and so on so forth. so give these as additional information for the diagnosis of the person so that they can be more personalized uh what you call as personalized medicine uh can can also evolve so uh while the teleconsultation and telemedicine uh, telehealth overall uh is is can be thought of as connecting the patient to the doctor just having this platform and uh the the evolution around it the need that creates around it in terms of understanding what are the qualitative and quantitative parameters of the patient is so that the diagnosis is more precise and then reducing the time for diagnosis itself and all of the different stages that dr satish mentioned will uh, give rise to more and more innovation around these digital technologies uh, particularly in ai and uh, point of care devices and uh, automated diagnosis uh, with uh, doctors uh, review Uh, put into the picture i think that I is very exciting uh, to me as a technologist as well and as well as entrepreneur because we are uh, also trying to do for example cancer care which was never ever thought of as a home care right is something that uh, at niramai we have been able to uh, make it as a home screening possibility yeah and how is that possible because one of course the device itself is portable and radiation free and so on but because there is an ai element to it you know we can uh, at the point of care generate the uh, you know the report itself and then of course it will be reviewed online or offline by a doctor to make sure that the end to end cancer care also can be done outside of hospital i guess this is one of the first times yeah, that we have seen and then such innovation will surely see more uh, mushrooming around uh, telehealth absolutely so uh, the interface of ai um, big data iot etc is going to really become the new cradle Uh, which will catalyze uh, telemedicine and its utility in a very big way coming back to amit amit how will the payer benefit through telemedicine payers get benefited in multiple ways uh if you look at the health insurance industry in more developed countries than india you get to see that in countries where the marriage between telemedicine and health insurance companies i.e. the payers has already happened there the number of diagnostic tests uh, prescribed to patients generally go down uh, there the insurance companies uh, are paying far less per uh, policy holder or user then in some other countries where the marriage between telemedicine and virtual healthcare is yet to happen but the marriage between telemedicine and health insurance is yet to happen and and that makes sense why because if you have a captive lab or a lab with which you have an entrepreneurial arrangement then as a doctor sometimes you have a propensity to prescribe one too many tests so uh, you know telemedicine being more arms length 
curtails that practice from get go. Uh, the other thing is telemedicine also helps in early detection. As I was talking earlier, uh, the tendency of people of uh, kicking the can down the road, thinking apne ap thik ho jayega, when we all know that stitch at time prevent the other nine. So with telemedicine, because of less friction involved between the doctor and the patient consultation, patient ends up uh, consulting the doctor and the doctor can red flag it and prescribe certain tests, you know, much earlier than before it is too late for the patient. So this way uh, you are looking at a far healthier, far happier, far longer living society where Medicare or healthcare is available at the tap of the app or the click of the mouse. Uh, the other benefit for the payer community is uh, many of these uh, payers also have younger population. So younger population call it in their 20s or 30s where the illness or the usage of health insurance won't be very, very high. Now, incidentally, it's the younger population which also experiences a higher churn rate for these payers. So if you're a 25 year old who has taken a first health insurance plan independently and you haven't used it at all and you've still paid 20,000 rupees for that annual health insurance plan, you ask this question to yourself, hey, why am I using health insurance? I'm in the best of my health. I don't need health insurance. So next year, you may either downgrade the plan or may not even take the plan. Whereas if health insurance is giving you a tool like, you know, a telemedicine solution like Dr. Insta, in, in those cases, the churn rate of these uh, people who are paying the premium and not using health insurance, i.e. The, the more profitable users of the, or the more profitable customers of the health insurance companies, the retention rate of these customers would increase drastically and the churn would reduce uh, uh, you know, exponentially as well. It's also proven. So, uh, so because of all these benefits, uh, you would see that all the developed countries have laid a lot of emphasis on telemedicine being a standard feature, whether it was Obamacare in US or NHS in UK or you know, German healthcare system or Canadian healthcare system. The focus is now that we should weave in telemedicine along with the health insurance plans. And this thing is having a domino effect on developing countries like India, Southeast Asian countries, African countries, Latin American countries as well. Yeah. So net net, uh, the user would win, uh, the countries would have higher productivity and, uh, uh, and telemedicine would become the order of the day. Also, I think earlier you guys spoke about uh, why it took telemedicine this long to catch up. I think telemedicine in India has a long way to go still. And I think you covered a lot of great points there. One more point that I would like to mention is smartphone accessibility in a country like India. You know, every single year we are seeing a triple digit increase in smartphone penetration, which means that people can now use telemedicine from their own smartphones rather than going to a telemedicine center, which used to happen back in the day. So it's like, you know, what happened with the cab industry in the past, if you had to order a cab, you would have to call some centralized number and the radio dispatch taxi would come to your doorstep. Now with Ola and Uber, people have the power to, you know, dis, uh, dispatch the cab as and when they want, which led to a higher usage of cabs in, in all the countries. Same thing is happening to telemedicine uh, and clearly Corona, as you guys rightly mentioned, further provided a uptick mm -hmm. to the uh, penetration, adoption and engagement of telemedicine in the country. Excellent point, Amit. And we will come to the internet penetration and penetration of smartphones just in a moment when we talk about equity. But the great point which you made and uh, uh, to add to it, the private health insurance industry has been heavily subsidized. And for example, this year, it will have a huge windfall because elective surgeries have really uh, reduced like anything. So it is a rich spouse. And if it will come, up, come together, as you said, in matrimony, 
with uh, telemedicine, then it will become a really prudent couple, which will safeguard the interest of the payer uh, in a very, very substantial manner. Excellent point. So coming to the other point which you raised regarding uh, equity, how equitable is, a telemed is telemedicine going to be? And what are the various facets of equity, Dr. Satish? So that's, I think, you know, to me, the most important, um, you know, question, right? I uh, look at equity in two forms. So um, let's say equity for those people who are living in an inaccessible, let's say, region, either due to geography or either due to monetary, let's say, um, availability with them. And telemedicine can be the great platform where people can have healthcare access at a lesser cost because they don't have to pay the burden of poverty premium because they have to travel to a city, they have to pay for the transport, they have to pay for the day's work or the labor loss for a day. So I definitely feel, uh, you know, telemedicine can bring in equity for people who are physically distanced or let's say who are monetarily distanced. That is part one. Second is, I think, you know, just uh, bringing it on the payer side. So payers have a vested interest to use telemedicine because telemedicine can be very effectively used in the preventive care. So let's say Gita does uh, breast cancer screening uh, and it's a preventive mode. So if you, if as a payer, my patients are all screened for breast cancer or let's say any form of cancer or any form of chronic diseases, at a very early stage, I can catch them, I can control them with a less amount of money. If they are caught at a late stage, as a payer, I have to pay a lot of money. So, you know, at the early stage, around 10 years back, we work with ICICI to look for a risk-based premium. So what the payers are looking for is, if I can know the risk of the individual, I can actually incentivize him for the good practices. So let's say he has gone through the preventive test. He has maintained a good uh, balanced lifestyle. He is not smoking. He is not alcoholic. He is having a good night's sleep. Uh, then maybe I can charge him less premium because he is less likely to get sick. So this is seen to be in healthcare economics, a better driving force where payer comes, they find a vested interest to keep people healthy so that they are actually ending up paying a lot more, you know, difficult, uh, let's say, you know, bills, you know, in future. Coming to equity for a country like us, you know, which is India, where Aishman Bharat is now started, as the largest uh, public payer kind of a system. But if Aishwan Bharat has to come into effect uh, with the challenges, what the normal hospitals are facing now, the rates or the bills or the tariffs are not sustainable for big hospitals or also let's say mid-side hospitals. The tariffs are actually very, very low. So how do you involve the private capacity like the tier two or tier three or tier four hospitals who can actually be the provider for Aishwan Bharat yet to be profitable? And again, their telemedicine is the only way. So they can participate through telemedicine where the cost per patient is going to be very, very less for uh, doctors or the providers. And that is the only way how Aishman Bharat can sustain in the long run. So people can go for all kinds of screenings, all kinds of preventive tests, all kinds of follow-ups without spending much, as well as without burdening the payer in the long run. So I would feel uh, as the payer and the provider come together through technology for having a good motive of uh, providing the best preventive care for uh, patients. Uh, this will provide the ultimate equity to all of those people, you know, who are currently being left out from the tertiary, glazy and uh, glittering, uh, you know, big hospitals, uh, which is, which has done great work on tertiary care, but unfortunately not done very good work on the primary and the secondary care. Very good point. You have uh, uh, shown the spotlight on economic equity. How telemedicine can really uh, be economically equitable. Are there any other aspects of equity, Gita? And uh, if yes, what are they and how will telemedicine impact them? Yeah. Gita. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, you know, this is very close to my heart, right? You know, how do we give and how do we do the healthcare delivery in a man manner that it is scalable and also re it does reach the rural uh, and the uh, underprivileged, right? Like uh, Dr. Satish pointed out, definitely by reducing the cost of interacting with the doctor, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, it does address uh, a bit of the economic side of things. There is still the awareness and the comfort of using a smartphone. Yes, a WhatsApp can be done by anybody today. It's really wonderful to see uh, people doing, let's say, uh, Google Pay or Paytm, right? Uh, so, so it's very nice to see that change. 
Uh, having said that, it is really true that there is even considerable number of people who may or may not be very comfortable using the devices, uh, you know, the apps, uh, uh, you know, um, in the hands of their own, right, to answer the questions and so on. So there I feel, uh, you know, still telehealth and telemedicine uh, can, can still be a benefit to, the, to provide an equi equitable um, care, you know, um, healthcare itself. Uh, the way I think we could also evolve this is to uh, have this kind of middleman piece back, right? And the middleman could be the uh, the PHC, the primary healthcare center or the community healthcare center. Now you can think about these device, these uh, places as uh, being more empowered because they're not just limited to the one doctor serving the thousand villages concept, right? Now the same PHCs are now able to access uh, the experts or the best of the experts in the in the, their own specialization, uh, you know, in a uh, in a uh, click of a button type of thing. So, so I feel the PHCs can now be more empowered with the telehealth and uh, the point of care devices that's needed to make this sort of end to end uh, extended hospital possible. So I, I think in the future, you know, combination of telehealth, the point of care devices, and the AI bit. Uh, can actually improve the healthcare distribution and the uh, you know uh, non equity that we have uh, today uh, or at least uh, till now uh, and enable really sophisticated healthcare possible even at the nooks and corners of India and that yeah. excites me a lot right you know that yeah. I think is a is a super good future for India that uh, we wouldn't have perceived otherwise. Great. So basically, between both of you, what you have said is that uh, the tariffs should be consistent, uh, reasonable. The, uh, the economic side of equity is very important. Uh, the social, socio-cultural equity also comes into play here. The Joint Commission has said that the, uh, that the user interface of these systems should be, uh, should be uh, comprehensible to a fifth grade student. So sometimes these sign up requirements are cumbersome. Sometimes the uh, user interface is extremely clunky. Sometimes a lot of downloading of apps has to be done. So the, you spoke about the middleman. I think there's another middleman required here, a virtual care chaperone. Uh, <laughs> what we were talking about as we started, like the reception, you know, uh, uh, yeah. like the reception or the information desk in the hospital, we should have a virtual care chaperone also who can provide uh, help us provide uh, the digital access to those patients who are uh, uh, technologically handicapped. And I think another point which you brought about uh, is technological equity, which is related to uh, internet penetration, which Amit spoke of, which is only 38%. Of course, it is growing very fast. Smartphones are also growing very fast. So this kind of equity also has to be keep, kept in mind. And uh, with that, we come to the other point, which is privacy. So Amit, how important do you think privacy is as uh, a vulnerable, uh, uh, as a vulnerable uh, piece as telemedicine moves forward? Amit. Telemedicine players like Dr. Insta are far more secure in terms of keeping patient records then your own doctor's office could be or would be. Uh, we at Dr. Insta use double encryption on both the client side as well as the server side. Uh, we are HIPAA compliant, although India doesn't follow HIPAA, but you know, US has developed this gold standard when it comes to uh, you know, privacy and confidentiality of the information. So, uh, you know, they are as private as they can get. Uh, can you break the bank? Yes, you can, but it's very, very hard. Uh, so same thing applies to encryption and uh, data privacy when it comes to telemedicine as well. It's far more difficult to break the encryption here than, uh, you know, the records which you would find at the doctor's office of yours. So patients or the users don't have anything to worry about when it comes to privacy or confidentiality of, uh, you know, the doctor patient consultations or 
their patient records, which are saved at again super secure electronic patient record uh, management module at Doctor Insta. Uh, and going forward too, I would think that uh, we would keep on innovating. We would keep on uh, devising new ways uh, to keep the hackers at bay who are looking for this information. Uh, and so net net, I don't think any people have to worry about privacy issues with Dr. Insta or any of the other leading telemedicine companies out there in the world. Uh, so I hope it answers your question, Pawan, when it comes to privacy. Excellent, excellent answer. And I would like now uh, Dr. Satish to amplify this. And, yeah, and, so and, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I take it in a, uh, let's say, a mixed way. So. Uh, this more of behavioral economics here. So whenever something new happens, uh, you know, we always tend to find uh, maybe this is dangerous or this is, let's say, is going to be scary or this is going to steal away something. But uh, the analogy of fintech, I think, you know, more of us are worried about, you know, somebody stealing my money than my patient record or my you know health record. Uh, but if you see most of the banks, you know, including India are digital and uh, are catering, you know, through the digital platforms. Uh, which tells technology has come to a that level where uh, data can be stored securely, can be shared securely, as well as can be analyzed securely. But uh, does it say that, you know, we have arrived at a technology level where uh, privacy is no more an issue? I don't agree with that. You know, it, there are still rooms of, for improvement. But if you think of technologies like, let's say, federal learning or blockchain, they definitely add to the added security of like encryption and the other security you know, practices, whatever we have. So two basic parts, I think, you know, telemedicine providers should take care of is they have to abide by the law of the land and the regulator has got a responsibility to define what is healthcare privacy. And a very good part from Government of India is they have recently published, I think last week, uh, as part of the digital uh, health mission, uh, what is the privacy rules? So the uh, government of India itself is defining a PHR centric or a patient health centric, which can be tied to your other. And uh, you have the patient should be owning the data, uh, which would be acting like UPI as it uh, actually revolutionized fintech uh, in India, like Paytm, phone pay. Same way there would be a healthcare UPI equivalent, which is in the works. So government is actually working on that UPI framework equivalent for healthcare, uh, you know, interoperability standard, which is a very big boon for people like, let's say, Amit or any other, you know, aspiring telemedicine practitioners. So I think here that the government has taken a proactive step and also the technology is available, which is at a very quite mature stage now, which can be leveraged to ensure privacy. And third is, uh, this is not compromisable. So all the telemedicine providers should be looking for privacy as a default or hygiene option as they are catering to the patient's needs and uh, you know other needs. Uh, one important thing, it's very important to understand now, you know, which we also came together uh, as well as scientists, is during Corona, you know, the future wars are going to be more biological and more cyber. So, you know, it is predicted that the future work is going to be cyber biological. And then, you know, your healthcare data becomes extremely important. You know, it is a national security issue. So uh, the telemedicine startup should be adopting to the law of the land. But I would also encourage the naysayers that, you know, okay, no, by telemedicine, you would be compromising on privacy. No, the physical medicine is also not so robust on privacy matters. And the telemedicine platforms are much better in privacy compared to the physical medicine, you know, counterparts. So we need to have a cautious optimism for privacy. And there is a responsibility for from each one, from the patient, from the doctors, from the telemedicine providers, from the regulators, and from the technologists. If they all work, together, this is going to be a very good, you know, optimistic future. That's what I feel. Great points. Great points. In fact, you have uh, brought in another angle. You have said that healthcare is getting uh, geopolitic importance. Yes. Yes. Today, uh, a, a pacemaker can be hacked or its battery downloaded or shocks can be given. That means uh, pacemakers have moved into the defense space. And uh, uh, so, that is why uh, privacy is important uh, and uh, the fact that uh, if actually the data, how large it is and whose hand it falls in is the problem. 
so if it hands uh, i mean the experience says that if it hands in the uh, ha- uh, if it lands in the hands of a uh, ill meaning politician you can lose your freedom and if you lands in the uh, hands of ill meaning business for example an insurance business then they can utilize that to increase your premiums this and that etc without uh, by uh, indiscriminate knowledge of your data yeah. and uh, if it can be made aggregate and anonymous and uh, then uh, this data if shared with businesses or politicians it does not allow make us more vulnerable and third point which you brought in is that this is a technology problem why privacy issues are coming because you have the technology to store all that data and technology itself is bringing a solution for example blockchain etc great points so i will have to now come to the questions because the questions which are coming are very intelligent they are coming from ceos or cxos so i will not go for that as designation uh, uh, let me start with what we have got from amitabh jain and let me ask geeta this question some of the tech solutions can be done for physical meetings such as history taking ai assistance in de- diagnosis etc so will that necessarily help in telemedicine or how it can help in telemedicine or is it already helping geeta sure so uh, definitely there is a lot of technology available in digitization of health records itself so for example earlier records or you know mostly are uh, paper in nature right or, or it could be like a, a a mammogram or an ultrasound of an image that you've taken uh, 10 years ago 5 years ago 2 years ago 1 year ago so you want the doctor wants to see all of it together so the digitization technology not just scan and upload you know scan ocr and upload that's been around for like from a bpo standpoint i think that can actually sort of come back uh, in a more meaningful way because we are not just talking about scan and upload understand what is being scanned uh, that the tool has to understand and then give it as a meaningful input to the doctor right so that definitely uh, you know uh, can come in a long way i'm sure uh, many of the telemedicine applications will start supporting this as a, a useful way of creating the patient side uh, you know health records uh, that we talked about uh definitely that is uh, that can be used and that has been used earlier in uh, the hospital setting and now uh, can definitely uh, be used at the patient level even at home thanks to the smartphones and uh, very super resolution uh, and uh, you know uh, cameras that are available in the smartphone today okay coming now to amit munjal with the next question which is coming from prabal chakrabarti from cii himanshu sharma from zaidas hospitals and swapnil uh, lime uh, uh, from uh, uh, from my my dia they are all uh, leaders so the question is would patient behavior go back face to face to face consultancy when uh, normalcy returns so this is a question which you must you would have surely pondered because your business is based on uh, this platform uh, what is it what is your view and what is the basis of your view sir amit so my view is that you have two sub segments one a uh, sub segment which constitutes of current users of telemedicine and then the second sub segment is which the users which have not used telemedicine yet so if you look at the sub segment which is the current users of telemedicine because of corona or even prior to corona clearly because of corona the current users numbers have increased uh, multifold like for example at dr insta our uh, telemedicine consults from pre corona times to now have increased by little less than 400% so four times the volume uh and then there is a larger segment of the population which is yet to embrace telemedicine they get to hear about it from their friends family members extended circle of acquaintances but they are yet to you know jump on the bandwagon and use telemedicine so for the current users of telemedicine who also are accustomed to going to brick and mortar hospital just because they are at the very peak and they don't have access to brick and mortar hospitals yet because of contagion risk the number would go down but there would be a avalanche of the new users or new adopters of telemedicine which would 
more than make up for the a bit of loss of the current user proportion so let that if say if let's say 5% of the population in the country is using telemedicine at this point of time this 5% population may come down to 3 and 1/2% once corona goes away but out of the remaining 95% even if we get 10 more percent the net volume would go up so the new normal for telemedicine is going to be far higher and far bigger than it has been ever in the history of modern india great point what you are saying is the genie is out of the bottle it is very difficult to introduce something that people and clinicians like and then take it completely off the table not and just that, not just that you know the the mindset has changed now uh, of the government toward telemedicine principally in the past to government would provide all kinds of support for telemedicine but now they are like pushing it more and more uh, across the board so that it becomes mainstream sooner than later more so in a country like india which has one of the worst doctor to patient ratios and and then even in bigger cities where there is a, there is a higher concentration of doctors people have to deal with all kinds of logistical issues to get to a doctor losing out on productivity not just that the third push is also coming from the cxos of the large companies uh in the past we would get around you know 50 to 70 requests from the large companies hr departments comp and ben departments saying that listen we want doctor insta to be rolled out across our 10000 employees all over india or 50000 employees all over india our requests have gone up by 10 times wow. where the cxos are reaching out to us saying that listen Uh, this is the best thing that we can do to our remotely by offering them telemedicine solution It, as a employer we are happy to pay our employees would be using telemedicine for themselves as well as for their dependents net net it will improve the productivity it will reduce the medical absenteeism uh, across our employees and our employees would be happier healthier more productive uh at the end of the day if we roll out a telemedicine solution for them so this mindset this boardroom conversation that is happening as we speak about telemedicine it's never going to come uh, go back to the pre corona levels amazing basically you're saying this omelet cannot turn back into eggs <laughs> and another reason for that is this b2b avalanche of demand which is going to come anything you'd like to add to that dr satish uh yes i think i will just add to what amit said is uh, you know two groups of users if you will see um, one are the millennials um, and they hardly you know visited the hospitals and they you know registered any physical interaction as you said earlier right they preferred a, talking to a phone rather than you know having a physical interactions as they have experienced healthcare now through this covid era they have tested that you know telemedicine can be done and it can be trusted so those people are a big convert zone when it came to those people let's say people like uh, you know 35 plus or 40 plus who were more frequent uh, visitors of the hospitals and they were used to the physical interactions but uh, they never trusted in telemedicine now as they have tested telemedicine and yes this works and this can happen Uh, so i think the a large number of them also got converted so it's like i always call this as a geo phenomenon you know as geo started the free service uh, to take on airtel and vodafone and as people experience the service first and the benefits of it after that they got a lot of conversion same way covid has made this geo moment uh, for all the non telemedicine users so they experienced it and after experiencing it you know all those non trust issue whatever they had it has gone to you know their trust uh, they have started trusting it so the numbers are always going to be higher i would expect majority of the non urgent care are going to happen over telemedicine so let's say vaccination of a kid or asking for whether i should continue my medicine or not when to stop my medicine physiotherapy mental health sexual health uh, dermatology issues um, and uh, many things which can be done without visiting physically a doctor mostly after experiencing it first hand those people will be converting so it will stay actually in the long run so it is not going to come down that's what i see excellent point you have made you have said uh, you call it the digital uh, sorry the geo moment <laughs> yeah so 
आई वॉज रिमाइंडेड ऑफ दैट घड़ी डिटर्जेंट एड पहले इस्तेमाल करें फिर विश्वास करें और कोविड ने इस्तेमाल करवा दिया अब विश्वास हमें हो गया है कि हमें डॉक्टर से डायरेक्टली डिजिटल इंट्रैक्शन बेटर है यू नो फॉर मेनी 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 इंडिकेशन ग्रेट पॉइंट गीता वी वुड लाइक टू राउंड इट ऑफ विथ यू Uh, and of course i'll ask the others also to step in after that with this last question what are the uh, what, what do you think is the ecosystem uh, which you require for uh, te- uh, telemedicine to grow so one of the things which has come out is this one public awareness and experimentation geo model okay the other thing which has come out is user acceptance what are the other three four points in a generic manner which you need for telemedicine to grow and then i'll come to uh, amit and uh, satish yeah so uh, like i was alluding to uh, earlier in one of the questions you asked right uh, telemedicine is going to be the starting point right uh, i guess it's uh, you know my my guess of the future is that this is going to be the strata in which all the digital health can be delivered so in order for that to happen right uh, users should be able to do as many diagnostic tests you know because everything has to be data based as many things as possible closest to their homes if not at their homes at least closest to their homes and so the point of care devices need to be there as much as possible the triaging devices and so on that need to be there ability to have uh, this data from different data, uh, teleconsultations in one place the consolidation and and uh, the recent government uh, notice on the digital health id and all is a like, wonderful step towards that that coming together the platform being uh, stable and uh, secure and trusted then these devices giving the data you know there is no stopping this will become an inevitable way of delivering health uh, in future according to me as long as these things are fixed great points dr satish what would you like to add to that uh, she has spoken about the uh, the regulatory policy foresight platforms thoroughness uh, what would you like to add uh, there is very little to do so just to add on it so i put it always as uh, patient participation is very important to drive this uh, and which has happened to some extent uh, you know through this your moment uh and technology is very very important but i think the onus lies with the technologist also or the telemedicine providers also to keep it intuitive so we never got trained for a google or a facebook or a amazon or a flipkart so same way i think you know it cannot uh, be expected for people to get trained to use a you know telemedicine solution that's where you know i uh, you know don't agree with geeta on the middleman part so technology should be playing that middleman part also to make it very very intuitive that's the responsibility of the telemedicine solution providers or the solution makers third is i think the hospitals which are the providers had this uh, let's say uh, lock in their head that you know it has to be a physical or a infrastructure based uh, 500 bed hospital 1000 bed hospitals but healthcare is actually wherever the patient is and most of the patient live outside the hospital so it's a mindset change also for the hospitals which has started now through telemedicine they can cater to a larger mass than only the beds what they cater to when it comes to regulator i think they have got the largest role to play and uh, i think you know we are pushing we are participating into that digital data health mission blueprint which is which has come out and uh, government has been also proactive but it could have been much more proactive so uh, we could not have or the regulators could not have waited for covid to allow telemedicine as a legal entity before covid you know many people would not have understood but telemedicine was not a legal service it was not a legitimate service uh, let's say in karnataka you still could not have practiced telemedicine there was a high court order in maharashtra where you cannot practice medicine over whatsapp and there were so many restrictions and uh, i think uh, regulators didn't have a very good certificate when it came to that covid has to push them to open up telemedicine where telemedicine could have been opened as a legal service much earlier for a country like india so i think uh, when patients uh, providers payers uh, technology and regulators work together for the ultimate benefit of the patient this is one thing which is very important if the goal is for betterment of the patient then everyone is making money then the system stays sustainable if anyone is saying that you know i am having a skewed power or a unnecessary power and i can extract from the system then the system doesn't grow sustainably so i would feel uh, this is responsibility of all uh, this is a 
all win kind of a situation there is no one here is losing the pharmaceuticals are going to benefit the medical device manufacturers are going to benefit patients are going to benefit payers are going to benefit the hospitals are going to benefit government is going to benefit so i see you know little should actually stop us uh, achieving this uh, digital health journey if all of us come together for the larger good which is betterment of the patients excellent point and uh, you're right that uh, technology should be intuitive and just to uh, just to complement that point uh, from geeta's side uh, perhaps geeta was meaning that the that there are the lowest of the low in the technology acquaintance spe- uh, space yeah. for example in advertising when i was in advertising i came across uh, tribes which did not know how to climb stairs or they did not know how to put on the uh, the electric switch or put it off so maybe from that point of view but the beautiful point which you have brought in is and this rarely happens that everybody is winning when henry ford brought his uh, assembly line the workers won because the number of hours came down their wages went up and the cost of production also came down that was the biggest hit to communism uh the logic of communism because everybody won and you have also beautifully brought up the point everybody is winning in through telemedicine mm-hmm. and that that means it will be a very inclusive push and blessings it will get from the, all the communities great points dr satish amit munja last word what is it that you would like to add to the points which uh, dr satish and uh, geeta have made where uh, aware uh, dr satish has just added user acceptance the uh, geeta and satish have covered most of the points that i could think of one thing where india is a bit notorious is dispensation of medicines without patients showing proper prescription at the pharmacy stores so india is around you know little less than 1 million pharmacy stores and at almost all of them you can just show up without any prescription and get whatever medicine you want uh although there are laws in place that these medicines prescription drugs cannot be dispensed without having a proper prescription uh in the position of a buyer or a patient in this case but yet uh the uh the abidance to that law in india leaves much to be desired and then that's why almost anyone can get almost anything from these pharmacy stores and this is such a bad thing for the overall long term health of the patients where the patients can just walk in and get the strongest of the antibiotics from this not so informed or educated uh you know attendant who is not even a b pharma or d pharma or having any kind of you know medical knowledge or education uh won't inquire are you allergic to any medicines but would still give you the strongest of the antibiotics for your mildest of the problems making you more and more resistant to those uh medicines uh such that when if the need arises for you to take those medicines they won't work as efficiently as beneficially as they would have otherwise so this practice has to stop and even the most educated people in our country are guilty of walking into these pharmacy stores and asking the attendant bhaiya kya do and then that mindset has to change and when you ask these most educated people that why are you asking this attendant who doesn't know jack about medicine as to what you should take for your own body they say oh because i don't have time to go see a doctor and and uh, telemedicine and the formalization and the adoption of telemedicine in pan india would change that mindset if you go to you know cvs walgreens right aid kind of pharmacy chains in us they have a separate section where they have put these you know monitors and screens uh where you can just sit and via telemedicine you get connected to a doctor on the other side and you can get a formal proper prescription that you can now get fulfilled through the same pharmacy store so uh here in in those situations you are not taking unnecessary medicines 
at the and you're not at the back end of the call of the attendant who is at the pharmacy store. So uh, telemedicine adoption would should drastically change that, but the law also needs to be tightened both for the user who doesn't have a prescription as well as more so for the pharmacy store which is dispensing these medicines without caring about the long-term ramifications on the health of this buyer or patient in this case. Great point. So basically what you have said that uniquely in India, the doctor saab will get competition from chemist bhaiya, you know, in the telemedicine space also. So uh, basically, I think the the uh, the entire panel has been so thought provoking and so thorough in its discussion. Uh, what we are concluding here is, is with, as far as the future is concerned, what telemedicine requires is public awareness, user acceptance, business models, a reimbursement policy, which Amit, you also spoke of earlier, policy foresight and thoroughness, and implementation of the laws and intuitive technology. So given these uh, tailwinds, telemedicine can surely soar uh, enduringly. And on that note, I thank you all and I thank all the audience in such large numbers, you stay with us even when we cross the limit, time limit, uh, which we often do because of the questions and because of the content of the discussion which is uh, happening. So thank you very much, audience, and I will pass it on to Siddharth now. Thank you very much, uh, sirs and ma'am. Uh, our leaders and I have taken home so many nuggets from the conversation today and, and very well moderated, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot. I'm still receiving positive messages from our leaders on our on our WhatsApps and our emails. So thank you very much. While a lot of the questions have been covered wonderfully and has given us a well-rounded idea of the landscape, we've also received specific and focused questions which may require a longer and one-to-one -one discussion between the leaders in the audience and experts. And we would be very happy to fix meetings between you and our pool of experts in the healthcare domain and other domains as well for mutual benefits. So thank you once again, and thank you to our attendees for staying till the end in large numbers. Uh, whether you would like to engage with us through our expert panel or as learners, you're invited to connect with us for membership. We're soon launching our digital platform exclusively for business leaders. And we will be sending out invitations to the first thousand leaders across our four sectors, which are healthcare, e-mobility, energy, and real estate. So thank you very much, sirs and ma'am, and thank you to the audience for, for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.